If you got your Bibles, we're going to be in the book of Acts. We'll start at the first chapter of Acts today. You got your handout. Go ahead and get that out. We've been talking to you about the church over the last couple of weeks. Jesus said, I will what? Build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Aren't you glad you're safe in the house of God? Aren't you glad that there's a covering, there's a hedge, there's a covering that encamps about us, that protects us from the world in the body of Christ? The gates of hell shall not prevail. This is what we taught the first week on the church. We taught on believing on the name of Jesus. Jesus asked his disciples, you remember, who do men say that I am? And one of the disciples said, well, some say you're Elijah, some say you're Jeremiah. And then Jesus turned and said, but I don't want to hear hearsay. I don't care what they believe. How many of you know that he builds his church on what you believe in him? And he said, but who do you say that I am? And Peter jumped up and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this unto you, but my Father. How many of you know that it's about hearing His voice? Not some hearsay voice that comes from some other source. When you hear God's voice, He changes you. That's why I pray constantly, Lord, let your people hear your voice. Because that is what Jesus Christ builds his church. That's the rock. And he said, upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail. How many of you know when the voice of God speaks to you, no devil in hell can stop the voice of God in your life. So we talked about the importance of believing on Jesus Christ. Believing in Christ for yourself. How, you, how many of you know that, that if you ask me anything in my name, that will I do that my Father may be glorified is what Jesus said. So we believe in Jesus. The next week we talked about covenant, right? We talked about covenant being a pledging of our lives. The first person we pledge our lives to is God. Lord, we give you our life. We commit our hearts and our lives to you, Lord. And then we covet, we covenant with each other. The body of Christ. I tell you, that I pledge my life to you, Miss Janice. My life is your life. We are one in the body of Christ. This is one body, one family. If you're hurting, if you're going through something, I'm going through something, I'm hurting, I'm with you. We are one in the body of Christ. So covenant. That's something that the church has got to get, get in their hearts with the fickle generation that we live in. It's almost like your word doesn't matter. Meaning I can tell you any old thing. But how many of you know your word is you? And you can't separate you from your word. So if your word is not right... <laughs> That's right, Miss Hilda. <laughs> Miss Medea. That's right. 
So we talked about covenant. How many of you know we are a covenant people? That's why when you get married, you just can't divorce for any old reason. Because it's a covenant that you've made. So we're, we're a covenant people. We have the authority of God. Our word means something. Our agreement means something. When we tell someone we're going to do something, then we're bound to do it because we're a covenant people. That's who the church is. Can I get an amen? amen. Now today, I want to talk to you about the power of the church. I want to talk to you about the Holy Ghost and three baptisms that we're going to look at from the Scripture. I've given you a, a statement of what Miracle Place Church believes. I gave you 18 statements that is just an extra handout for you to understand what the leadership of this church actually believes concerning the Holy Spirit and His gifts. How many of you know that we believe that the Holy Spirit is just as relevant today as it was for the early church? We believe that the gifts of God are still in, the oper in operation. We won't believe dispensationalism where they went out with the early apostles when the Bible came, when we got the Bible. We believe that the Holy Spirit is still the power of God and still wants to do miracles in the church today. And at Miracle Place Church, we are not a seeker-sensitive church. Meaning that Maybe you have a misunderstanding about the Holy Spirit and His gifts. Maybe you came from a diverse uh, denomination or, or background. We do not think it's sufficient for us that, that, that we wouldn't operate in the Holy Spirit because maybe you have a disagreement or maybe you don't understand. At Miracle Place Church, we believe in the Holy Spirit. We believe in His power. And we want His power. We honor you, Holy Spirit. You are welcome. We are strong enough that when someone is out of order, like in emotionalism, or they are abusing or misrepresenting the Holy Spirit, the leadership is strong enough to get you in order. We're strong enough to say, hey, that's not God. And we won't have that but we welcome the work and the gifts of the Holy Spirit in this church. We've got to be, we've got to let God be God. If we don't let the Holy Spirit be the Holy Spirit, we have no power. Now, are you guys ready? All right, we'll start with number three then in the handout. I've already talked about one and two. So we're, we're talking about the Holy Spirit. Next slide. Many people think that Jesus' final words to his disciples were, Go ye therefore into all the world and make disciples. But really, that's not what Jesus' last words were. His last words were really this, Wait for the promise of the Father. So let's take a look at it. We're in Acts chapter 1, verse 4, and we'll start with verse 4. And being assembled together with them, commanded them, that's Jesus with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but what? Why did he tell them to wait? Because if they'd have went out without the power, they would have been ineffective. How I many of you know that if you don't got the Holy Ghost, you don't got no power? And who in the world wouldn't want the power? <laughs> so he said, but wait for what? The promise of the Father. And thank you, Father, that there's a promise for us. Which he said that you have heard of me. For John truly baptized you with what? With water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence, or, or not many days to come. Verse 8, but you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, 
and then shall you be what? Witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and unto, unto the uttermost parts of the end of the world. I believe Judea, uh, Jerusalem is local, your city. I, I believe uh, Judea is your region. I believe Samaria is the unclean areas. You got to go reach them too, the Samaritans. And I believe the uttermost part of the end of the world is all the world. God calls us to reach the entire world for him. How many of you know that includes everybody? And when he had spoken these things while they beheld him, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly towards heaven where Jesus went, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which said, you men of Galilee, why do you just stand here gazing into the heavens? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall also come in like manner as you have seen him go today in heaven. How many of you know that that was the final word that Jesus gave us, was to wait until we receive the promise of the Father which is the Holy Spirit. Now, this is what I believe. I believe the church does a great disservice to people that doesn't allow them to get the full teaching of the Word of God, which is the Holy Spirit. And that's why I'm talking about three baptisms today. Are you guys ready to jump into it right now? So let's go ahead and jump into it. The first baptism is the baptism of salvation. The scripture says, For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, and we've been talking about the body of Christ. You know that that's us. That's who we are. When we experience salvation, we are baptized into one body, and we call that the body of Jesus Christ. How many of you know we're doing his work? This is the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but it's not the baptism in the Holy Spirit. How many of you know that you get your glass halfway full when you get saved? When you accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you get sealed. And we're going to take a look at it in a minute. Baptism of water is what we call the second baptism, and that's after you've made Jesus Christ Lord and Savior of your life, and in obedience to Him, you identify with His death, burial, and resurrection. Therefore, you go down into a liquid grave. Come on now. You die to your old life, and by going down, you're buried with Jesus Christ. You're saying that I'm now in Jesus Christ. Jesus went down into the grave, and then Jesus Christ was raised, resurrection power from the grave. I'm following Jesus because now I'm saved. I've given my heart, my life to Jesus Christ. And when I come out, it represents the new life because if any man be in Christ Jesus, he's a new creature. Old things have passed away and behold all things have become new notice when I'm baptized I'm I'm in him in other words I'm not just being dunked in some water because I do that every day when I take a bath <laughs> nothing happened then I went down <laughs> dirty and I came up a little clean with some uh, dirt off of me but it didn't wash any sin dirt off of me only the blood of Jesus does that. The third baptism is what we call the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Matthew chapter 3, verse 11, and this is the, what the Scripture teaches. And I gave you in all four Gospels the same Scripture. I'm not going to read all of them. I'm just going to read one. You can go look at them for yourself. By the way, if they're in all four books, it's pretty important. So anytime you emphasize something, reiterate it over and over and over, how many of you know it's important? I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. It's talking about John the Baptist. But he that comes after me is mightier than I. I'm not even worthy to untie his shoes. And he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. 
I mean, you know, Jesus will baptize you, emerge you, full measure, fill you with the Holy Ghost. And I can't, for, for, the, for the life in me, I can't imagine why anybody wouldn't possibly want that. What? <laughs> Jesus is saying, I want to fill you with power. I don't want that. I'm scared of that. Oh, it's spooky. And the reason why it's spooky is, is because there's such a stigma with tongues. Can I just tell you, it ain't about tongues, it's about power. If you're worried about tongues, you done got, the devil's got you. Because he loves to distract you and hinder you and keep you from seeing the truth. The truth is not tongues. Some folks got spiritual pride and they speak in tongues out loud to show you how spiritual they are. By the way, that's error. And that stuff gives the Holy Spirit a bad name. You know, especially if you got to show how spiritual you are by walking in some kind of spiritual gift and everybody needs to see you. Man, that, that ain't what we're doing here. We want the real Holy Spirit and the real voice of God to speak to our hearts. We want God to change us. We want God to make us what He wants us to be. So we find this in four different accounts in, in the Gospels, um, stating that Jesus is the baptizer in the Holy Spirit. I'm giving you those scriptures and you can look them up. That's a very important doctrine. That's why it's in all four books. Same as it's an important doctrine about resurrection, death and resurrection. These are vital truths that believers have got to understand in order to walk in the fullness of God. Can I get an amen? That's why it's in four books. So scripture clearly shows us that Jesus is the one who performs this baptism, emerging us in the Holy Spirit. This baptism has been harmfully misrepresented, in many, and as a result, many Christians avoid it today because it's been misrepresented. How could Jesus Christ baptizing us in the Holy Ghost possibly be a bad thing? I'll say it again. How could it be bad? It's misunderstood. That's the reason why. Gotten focused on tongues and feeling like it's crazy and some kind of way that it's stupid because your mind doesn't understand it. I told Jeannie a long time ago, if you don't understand something in the kingdom of God, put it on a spiritual shelf and later on God, if he chooses, will pull it off the shelf and show it to you and put it in your life. Until then, don't run a touchdown. Don't worry about it. The promise of the baptism in the Holy Spirit came powerfully to the disciples in Acts chapter 2. Because you remember Acts chapter 1, he said to wait for the promise. Now the disciples and Mary were in the upper room and praying and interceding. They were scared. They were scared they were going to get crucified. Then all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit came into the room like as cloven tongues and sat upon their head, and all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. When they got filled with the Holy Spirit, Peter took the boldness that he got from the Holy Ghost, and immediately he goes out of the room, because he received the promise of the Father. He waited for it and he got it. Now the boldness and the power of God is in him. And now he comes out ready to preach. He preaches a sermon. And 3,000 people on the day of Pentecost get saved. You better shout somebody. He preached a word that was not just a man talking. It was God talking through him. And when he spoke, because it was the Holy Ghost, it cut him to their heart. The Bible says it pierced. It cut him to the heart. And when it cut him to the heart, it started changing them. It started working on the inside of them. Because God starts working because it's him and not a man. It's his power. And they ask, what must we do? And that's when you get the teaching, the first teaching today on the three baptisms. Look what Peter said. Peter said unto them, you got to repent, you got to be water baptized, and you got to receive the Holy Ghost. The first baptism then is repentance. It's salvation. 
As soon as you accept Jesus Christ, you're baptized into the body of Christ. Are y'all out there? The next thing it says, you got to be water baptized. Peter teaches them now that we, we are saved and we have to follow the example of Jesus Christ by being water baptized. This is the second baptism. And then the third baptism is this. Accept the gift of the Holy Spirit. I'll give you the scripture. I'm in Acts chapter 2, verse 38. It says, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. The three baptisms, repentance is salvation. Water baptism is the second baptism. Follow an example of your repentance, that, meaning that you're going to follow Jesus from now on. And then he says there's another experience that's separate from salvation experience, which is called immersion in the Holy Ghost. And this is the baptism of the Holy Ghost. So once you've been saved, once you've been water baptized, and not necessarily do you have to be water baptized to be filled with the Holy Ghost, because Cornelius' household in Acts chapter 10, they were baptized in the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues before they did water. Because once they heard them, and these were Gentiles, and, and Peter, uh, Peter and, and was amazed. He said, man, God is falling even on the Gentiles like we looking like we're some kind of lower class. But then he said, what forbids them to be baptized for they have received the Holy Spirit just like we have Jews? I mean, you know that God's included the whole world in this promise. The promise of the Father is to the world. That's why he says, uh, the promise is unto you and to your children and to as many as as far off will come. To the Jew and to the Gentile. To the bond and the slave. For male and female. Everybody the, is the promise. God doesn't withhold his power from anybody. The only way we don't receive the power of the Holy Spirit is, is we have to choose to receive it. If as a free mortal agent I don't choose to receive it, then you can be satisfied with a gown of salvation if you want. I'm go I want all the gusto. I'm going after God with all my heart heart. I want every bit that God has for me. I'm going after the Holy Ghost. I want God. <laughs> I want all of God in my life. And I would just absolutely say, what in the heck would be wrong with you? <laughs> Except that the enemy would try to make it spooky and make, make you feel like, oh, something's wrong or you're going to get the wrong spirit. Man, look, if you ask your father, for some bread, is he going to give you a snake? Is he going to give you a scorpion? A rock? Yes. That's what the scripture says in Luke chapter 11. Then we look in uh, Acts chapter 8. This is Philip. Y'all remember Philip? Philip is an evangelist. Philip is in Samaria. He's preaching under the power of the Holy Ghost. And when he gets there, a revival breaks out. But when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus, they were all baptized, how many? Men and women. All right, so let's take a look at it. Verse 12, you got your Bibles? I want you to really see it. We're in Acts chapter 8, and I'm slowing down a little bit because I really want you to see all three baptisms that was taught in the early church. I do not think that dispensationally, the Holy Ghost was only for one dispensation. I believe the Holy Ghost is for the whole church dispensation. I believe this is the power of the church. And I believe the enemy has tried to make us a powerless church so that we don't accomplish what God wants us to accomplish in planet Earth. And I think we do people a disservice when we don't teach all three baptisms, that's why people are struggling with frustration and failure in their life is because we as leaders have neglected to teach the three baptisms that were taught in the early church so that people are powerless instead of powerful. We got to make you powerful in the name of Jesus. So verse 12, but when they believed Philip, now when you believe uh the kingdom of God, when you believe in Jesus, what happens? 
You get saved, right? When you get saved, you're baptized where? Into the body of Christ, Pastor John. Thank you so much. So that's the first baptism. Believing. So there it is, right there, verse 12. We're in Acts 8, 12. When they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus, they were baptized, both men and women. All right, so the first one is believing. Believing in Jesus, I'm saved. I'm born again. Now I've been placed in the family of God, which is the body of Christ. First baptism. Caprande. See, a- Amen. Then they were water, then they were water baptized, because the scripture says they were baptized, both men and women. So they're they've accepted Jesus and now they're water baptized. That's two baptisms. Then si- all right, now I don't want to talk about Simon the Saucer because Simon the Saucer was a devil, and they, they finally got him right in the name of Jesus. He wanted to buy the Holy Ghost and all of that, and y'all know that story. So let's jump down to verse 14. Now, when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of the Lord, got saved, baptized in the body of Christ, um, they sent unto them Peter and John, who when they came down, prayed for them and welcomed them to the body of Christ and told them, you're good, man. That's all you need to do. Welcome to the church of God. You now have the power. You did everything you need to do. Oh, there's another baptism. There's another experience. There's another level in God. Shall somebody? My point is this. Is when Peter and John, apostles of the early church... Stationed in headquarters in Jerusalem, heard that Samaria had gotten saved and water baptized. They didn't just offer them the right hand of fellowship into the church and say, You're a good man. Lots of churches say that as long as you got saved, that's it. You're fine, man. It's gonna be all right. You're in the family. You are. You are in the family. But the early church taught that there's another level of power. There's another baptism that you got to have. Are y'all out there? And they prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. Somebody said, well, wait a minute. I thought that they had the Holy Ghost. They did have the Holy Ghost. They were in the church. But there's another, uh, there's another level of the Holy Spirit that the Father said, wait for. Make sure you receive it. Don't try to do anything for me until you get this next level of anointing in your life because you're going to need the power of the living God. You're going to need the boldness of the Holy Ghost in your life to be able to do everything that I've called you to do. Oh, some of y'all look at it. All right, this ain't even my notes. Turn to Acts 19. I'll show it to you again. Uh, You can only put so much in notes. So uh, I'll show it to you again. We're talking about three baptisms today. We're in Acts chapter 19, starting at verse 1. Thank you, Miss Mary. You sure are kind. Uh, Miss Ann, she got me straight. I'm sorry. Thank you. Look at that member said, you better call my name right. (laughs) And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul had passed through the upper coast, came into Ephesus and finding certain disciples. Who did he find? Are disciples believers? Are they saved? Now watch what he asked them. He said unto them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? Look what they said. We have not even so much as heard uh, uh, whether there is a Holy Ghost. He said, well then, 
what in the world were you baptized unto? Do, unto? And they said, well, we were baptized under John's baptism, which what? He, he says in verse 4, Then Paul said, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, which is right, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, and that is, Jesus is the baptizer of the Holy Ghost, and he is Christ Jesus. There's another level. Verse 5, and when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spoke with tongues, and they prophesied. And all the men were about 12. Believe on Jesus, baptized into his body. Water baptized to identify with that experience. Now there's another experience receiving the Holy Ghost, which is the power of God that will emerge you and totally fill you with his glory to do his work. I'll quote it. John, I'm getting off my lesson, but I'm just going to quote a little bit. John chapter 4. Jesus said to the woman at the well of Samaria, he says, girl, the water that I'll give you will be a well springing up in you unto everlasting life. That's a new birth anointing. That's the measure of the Holy Ghost that, that gives you a measure of God's power. But then in chapter 7, he said, all of those that are thirsty, hey, if you hungry for God, if you want more, mo, look at your neighbor and say, mo. I just heard the word from God. He said, tell them, Mo. 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 And go look it up. Y'all write the scripture down. I think it's 7, 38, 39. I wrote a book on this. In fact, I gave y'all that I wrote it years ago. I can really add to it now because I'm walking in more light. But here's what he said. All those that want more that come unto me, I will fill them with the Holy Ghost. And watch this. What? There's two words you got to get. And it shall be a river. And he, I don't like to say, he's not a it. He's a he. He's a person. The Holy Spirit's a person. And he, listen to this. And he shall be a river, not a well in you. He shall be a river, O-U-T, flowing out of you. Listen. The new birth anointing is for you. It's in you. The baptism of the Holy Ghost is a river that flows out of you. <laughs> and I'm going to give you one more scripture. We'll turn to 1 John chapter 5, verse 7. He says there are three that bear record in heaven. Now look, you got to understand. We're going to talk in these two verses. Heaven and how it's represented and who bears record there. And then it says there are three in verse 8 that bear record in the earth. Where do you live? Oh, hallelujah. That, then that means earth is going to be for you. So he said there are three that bear record in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And then he says there are three that bear record, verse 8, on earth. That's where I live. I need that witness. They bear witness. Record, Father, Word, Spirit. Holy Spirit. Witness, Spirit, water, and blood. How many of you know you're bought by the blood of Jesus? That's salvation. How many know that you're baptized in water? That'd be water. That's the witness. And how many of you know that you're filled with the Holy Ghost? That'd be the Holy Spirit. So the three witnesses on earth that identify the three baptisms on earth, you better shout with me, is spirit, water, and blood. And these three bear witness in the earth. (laughs) 
Get your statement sheet out real quick. I just want to make a couple of statements and I'm going to close. And I want y'all to read my Holy Spirit book that I wrote years ago. That little booklet, y'all got it? Hey, if you're watching on TV or online, if you uh, contact us, we'll send it free to you right there. Understanding the power of the Holy Spirit. I wrote it years ago. Reason why I wrote it is because so, so many people were so spooky about tongues and freaking out over tongues that I wrote a book saying it ain't about tongues, it's about the power. And if you don't want the power, something's wrong with you. I tried to make you feel stupid if you didn't have the Holy Ghost. Because it's very ignorant not to have the full measure of the promise of the Father. And I tried to dispel that stupid stuff. All right, so this is a statement sheet. What we did was is we just simply wrote a statement which creates perimeters for us and what we believe in our church. Right, guys? So somebody says, well, who are you? Well, when you, when you grow in a church, you got to figure out who you are, what you believe, what you're going to wear, which kind of personality, what are your doctrines. And if you don't have a statement sheet, you don't know who you are. Just like when you grew up, you started looking around at what other human beings did to figure out who you're going to be. That's why we need good role models. So here's, here's some statements, and I want you all to be able to read all of them. And I'm not going to read every one of them. But this is what we really believe in this church. Number one, we believe the need for the Holy Spirit's power and presence in believers' lives. We believe it's critical today as it was in the day of the apostles. How many of you believe that? We believe it's just as critical as it was for the early church. We believe the same church today needs the power of the Holy Spirit. If you believe that, say amen. amen. Number four. We recognize that families and members of Miracle Place Church, we come from different and diverse backgrounds. Can I get an amen? amen? We welcome the opportunity for people to grow in their understanding of the person and power of the Holy Spirit, as well as their understanding of the Holy Spirit's work in our lives. If you believe that, say amen. amen. All right, now... How many of you know that we will not force anybody ever in this church? So I'm just going to say it rather than read it, and you'll be able to read it. At Miracle Place Church, we will never force...